In just a minute, we're going to look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 29. We're looking at this newest generation. We're reflecting on how this is different from other generations past, but we're also talking about how Jesus is for this generation and is for this generation in even unique ways, as well as for every generation. This generation born from 1995 to 2012 is unique, but Jesus is for every generation. This is a generation that grew up with cell phones, has never known a time without an internet, and uh, had an Instagram account even before they went into high school. There's many generations here on the screen, and uh, I'm not sure which one you belong to. We each have different generations that we would belong to in different events and uh, technologies and such that have shaped us. But once again, Jesus is for every generation. We want to, we want to always remember that, no matter who you are or where you come from. Jesus is for you. Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 29. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve him. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I have come, or came out, rather. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, And he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. That's where we'll stop. You notice here in verse 35 that Jesus woke up early in the morning to just go away and be by himself. Jesus liked his alone time. He, He wanted to be alone at times. He was surrounded by people a lot, but just like most of us, we need we need our time and we can get away and and just be by ourselves once, once in a while. When he could get away, he, he did. He, he liked that alone time that he had. This new generation, this iGen, iGeners, they like their alone time too. Um, if you look at the surveys, uh, the 8th and 10th and 12th graders, uh, they spent at least one hour of leisure time alone nearly every day, and those are at all-time highs. More people of this generation are spending time by themselves, leisure time. When Jesus was alone, he would pray. This was time for him to connect with his Father. It says there in verse 35, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. He needed to get alone so that he could spend time with his Father. It wasn't just simply to be alone. He needed to pray. He needed to talk to God the Father in heaven. 
When I Jenners, and I need to point out many others also, not just this generation, when they're alone, they go online. This is the new pattern here, and I'm sure that many of you have noticed it. Whenever we have a moment, if you have a smartphone, you're probably looking at it. If you're waiting for an elevator, if you are waiting in a waiting room, or sometimes even if you're driving down the road, you have the moment to yourself, oh, I wonder what's going on. We, we have, this is our habit now. Jesus went alone to connect with his father. And when we're alone, when we have a moment, we want to connect to the internet. This is kind of the trend that's around right now, and I'm not exempt from this either. But if you look at the life of Jesus, and we'll look at a few things in this passage here, if you look at his life, how he lived it, almost everything Jesus did was done in person. He was a personal guy. He was the kind of guy who would show up. It, verse 30, it says he was told about Peter, Peter's mother-in-law. And it says that he went to her and he took her by the hand and healed her. He didn't snap his fingers from the other room. He actually went to her and took her hand and helped her get up. And she was well right away. In fact, she was so well that she started serving everyone. He did it in person. And Jesus healed people in person, not just that time, but many times. You can only find one or two times when Jesus healed somebody from afar. Almost every time he healed, it was in person right there. So the sick and afflicted, it says in verse 32, they were brought to him. They, they brought these sick people, these afflicted people, to him so that they would be healed. It says they lined up at the door of the house. You can imagine just this big crowd around the door where he was staying. All these people bringing all kinds of friends and loved ones who have all of these ailments of all different kinds, it says. And he healed them all. Jesus healed in person and he taught in person too. It's fascinating to me that Jesus didn't write anything. The only time that we have of him writing anything is when there was that woman caught in adultery and Jesus stooped down and started writing in the, in the dirt, and which hardly counts as writing because writing in the dirt is not going to last long at all. In fact, I had an a atheist professor from whom I took logic and uh, he was very openly atheist, and I still remember one time being in class and how he was basically picking on Jesus for never writing anything, as if that was almost like a, a black mark on his reputation, a, a way to discredit him. But Jesus didn't write, he went. He says, when Peter comes up to say, hey, everybody's looking for you, he says, Let's go to the next town I, I, so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. This is why I've been sent from heaven, to go and teach. And it's not that Jesus just simply didn't live in the digital age where he could post things on Facebook or other things. He, I think that if he were alive today, he would be going places in person to do his teaching. Because back then, even though they didn't have the technology that we had, they still wrote letters. You know, a big chunk of the New Testament is just letters. He could have written stuff, but he didn't. He could have sent a lot of messages by people, too. And he didn't. He was always teaching in person. He showed up. He was an in-person kind of a guy. He was the one who wouldn't do things from afar. He would show up and he would do it himself. He showed up and he followed through. Now as a whole, again, as a whole, not every last one, but as a whole, 
iGen is isolated. This is an isolated generation. Getting together with friends right now is at all-time lows. The number of teens getting together with friends every day has been cut in half in just the last 15 years. College students in 2016 spent four fewer hours a week with friends, three fewer hours a week at parties, which is a total of seven hours a week less with people than they did in the 80s. Going out with friends is, out, is down. Going to the mall is at all-time lows. There are malls that are closing right now. Driving around in the car just for fun is down. Going out on dates is down. Going out to movies is down. Being with people is down. And in some cases, at all-time lows. A quote directly from the book that I was reading here, it says, iGen teens are less likely to take part in every single face-to-face social activity measured across four data sets of three different age groups. In other words, this is unprecedented. This is an isolated generation. Online friendship is replacing face-to-face friendship. We have social media. We have Facebook. We have Instagram. We have Twitter. We don't need to see people face-to-face anymore. And that's what, that's what is especially true of this next generation. iGeners are Instagramming, Snapchatting, and texting friends more than seeing them in person. There's one, pers- one uh, 20-year-old who was interviewed It says, it's tempting to just text someone or to just go on social media and like someone's photo and comment instead of calling and being like, hey, do you want to go out and get something to eat? That takes planning. It's so much easier to connect with people on social media and then just never end up seeing them at all. Now, there's some who might argue that maybe online friendship is just as good as face-to-face friendship. You know, maybe it's basically the same. It's just different than in previous generations. But you'd make, it'd be hard-pressed to make that case. Sh- surveys show that teens who use social media every day are more lonely than those who don't. Social networking site use actually correlates, that means it goes up with, agreeing with the following statements. I often feel lonely. I often feel left out of things. And I often wish I had more good friends. In other words, the more kids used social media, the more likely they were to agree with those statements. Social media, just in my estimation, it's good for exchanging information. It's very useful for that. If something is going on in your life and you want everybody to know about it, you can post it and everybody knows about it like almost right away. It's, it's great for getting information out or sharing information. It's not as good for connecting with people. It's great for information. It's not as good for actually connecting We're plugged in, but we're disengaged. Using social media is also connected with feeling unhappy. There was a survey of 8th graders, and it showed this. Six hours a week on social media, you were 47% more likely to say that you were unhappy. Ten hours you were 56% more likely to be unhappy. So the more you use social media, the more likely you are to not only say I'm lonely, but even I'm unhappy. And this is what the book concludes, and I put the whole quote up here because I wanted you to see this for yourself. iGen is on the verge of the most severe mental health crisis for young people in decades. We have a mental health crisis 
that's about to take place right now. For example, high school seniors seeing a professional therapist in 1983, 4%. In 2000, 8%. In 2015, 11%. We have, we have a lot of loneliness and a lot of unhappiness in our society right now. Now, if you want to feel happy, if you want to just feel happy, then your prescription is to exercise and have face-to-face -face interactions. If you want to feel happy, that's what you need. Just do that, and you'll feel happy. If you want to be happy, if you want to be happy, get to know Jesus Christ more. Give your life to Him. Put your trust in Him. Connect with Him more and more through Scripture, through connecting with other believers, through that fellowship of believers, through prayer. If you want to be happy, nothing is going to make you happy more than Jesus Christ. If you want to just feel happy, there's some exercises you can do. If you want to be happy, if you want to actually have meaning in your life, if you want to have actual closeness with other people, if you want to have some heavenly direction, purpose, then get to know Jesus Christ more. Make that your life goal, to just know Him more and understand Him more, to feel what He feels, to think what He thinks, to walk in His ways to understand what it means to sacrifice and to serve. That's pretty much his whole life, was sacrifice and service. We, wanna, we, we have a tendency to want to get more all the time. He was all about the opposite of that, sacrifice and service. When humanity needed salvation from sin, God came in person to save us. God didn't snap his fingers from heaven to save us. He actually came down himself. He sent himself to us. Look at the screen here and let's respond to this together. What does it mean that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary? That the eternal Son of God, who is and remains true and eternal God, took to Himself through the working of the Holy Spirit from the flesh and blood of the Virgin Mary, a truly human nature, so that He might become David's true descendant, like His brothers in every way, except for sin. He showed up. He came in person. He didn't send a Facebook message or a text. He didn't Instagram our salvation to us. He showed up and became like one of us and walked the same ground that we walk and took on the same flesh that we have. He showed up in person. And He calls the hurting and the needy. There's a lot of people in our society who are lonely and are unhappy. There's a, there's a poem that's on the Statue of Liberty that I kind of like. I'm going to read just a portion of it. It says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest-tossed, to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Send me your poor and your knee, your hopeless, your tempest-tossed, the wretched refuse. This is Jesus talking too. This is basically what he was about. He says, when, when you, when you make, have a dinner... Don't invite all your friends or your rich neighbors who are going to invite you back. Invite the, the poor and the blind, the people who can't pay you back. 
Or Jesus takes this moment and he says this from Matthew 11. I have it on the screen here too. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come, come to me. If you're, if you're lonely, come to me. If you're sad, come to me. If you're unhappy, come to me. The things that the world promises that are going to make you happy, it's not going to work. The things that people are going to offer you in their relationships, it's nothing compared to what I can offer you. Come, come to me. There's this part of our passage that we read where Jesus heals this leper. In Jesus' time, lepers were segregated as unclean. And this goes way back. If you had leprosy, then there was much that you couldn't do. You were quarantined from the rest of society. You were an outcast. In the synagogue, you could come, but you had to stay behind this curtain, and you had to get there before everybody else, and you had to leave after everybody else so that you wouldn't come into any contact with anyone. I mean, you were... You were kind of treated as if you had the plague a little bit. These were the most lonely people at that time. They had no human contact. They had to stay certain distances from people. In fact, there's even prescriptions for how far apart you're supposed to be. It says you're supposed to stay at least four cubits, that's about this long. You have to stay four cubits away from people at all times, and if it, there's a wind blowing, then you have to stay a hundred cubits away. You imagine how lonely that would be. You imagine never shaking hands or having any human contact with anyone, ever. Because if you did, then you would make them unclean too. Jesus not only cleansed this man's leprosy, but he, he reached out and touched this man. He touched this man in his isolation. This is probably the first human contact that this guy has had in who knows how long, however long he had that leprosy. Can you imagine what it would be like to have human contact for the first time in many, many years? And Jesus did that. This is what Jesus does to us. He offers us some real contact, some real intimacy, a real connection. He offers us connection and intimacy that you would never know in any other human relationship. And this is what he offers. If you're lonely, if you're isolated, come to me. Those who trust in Jesus are actually never alone. You might feel alone, but you're not actually alone. If you put your trust in Jesus, if your hope is in Him, then you are not alone. In Psalm 27, I, I like this verse, it says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me. Even father and mother. You know, this, this, this day, uh, Father's Day, we celebrate um, our fathers and uh, we remember what they've sacrificed for us and the men that who have raised us. My father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. The Lord takes me in. You know, we, even in the best of our relationships, we have a breaking point where we would give up on one another. God does not give up on us. His love for us is greater than any love that we could have for one another. And He offers that to you. Jesus was often by Himself, but He was never alone. It says, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come. This is on the night of the Last Supper. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. He had a certain kind of fellowship with his father so that even when he was alone, he would start to pray because the father was there. 
And that's why he wanted to be alone, so he could spend some time with his father. Now, <clears throat> if this is how Jesus is, then that has implications for us as a church, too. Because we are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ where all are a part of Him. If you belong to Jesus Christ, then you are a part of the body of Christ. And you belong here. And we belong to one another. Just like one finger belongs to a hand. If you are a part of Jesus Christ, then you belong here. And we need to be a place where lonely people can come and belong to. If Jesus connects with people, even outcasts like lepers, then we need to be the kind of people who would connect with those people too. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, In one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. We, we all belong to each other. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Now you are the body of Christ. And that you means, is plural, that means all y'all. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So, if this is how Christ was, if he reached out to people who were lonely and hurting, then that means that that's our responsibility also. So here's, here's something for you. After church, we all leave and we go and talk to one another. And it's usually it's people that we, we know pretty well, right? We tend to gravitate to the people that we know best. I'll throw this out for you. If you see somebody who has nobody to talk to, you go up and talk to them. If you see anybody standing out in the narthex or downstairs in the basement who's not talking to anybody, you go and talk to them. Instead of looking for the people who you usually talk to, first make sure that everybody else has somebody to talk to, somebody else to connect with. Nobody should be lonely at church. Nobody. I know that there were times, just looking back at my own life, where I was really lonely at church. It was kind of rough because in the church I grew up, about half the kids went to the Christian school, and the other half went to the public school, and then there was me who was homeschooled. So there were a lot of times when I was the one standing in a corner and there was nobody to talk to. And I'd tried my best to just fit in. That hurts. And that should not be the case where we are the body of Christ who reaches out to even somebody like a leper and gives them human contact. My practice here is to shake as many hands as I can. And that's because there are some people who don't have much human contact at all. And a handshake is, is, is safe, you know. Some, some human contact is, you know, a little forward and, and you know, I don't want to cross any boundaries, but a handshake is safe. If you don't want to shake my hand, if that's too much for you, you, you know, just let me know, that's fine. But I want everybody who comes in this door, or as many people as I can, to have a handshake, that human contact, because I want them to know that they are welcome here. We are the body of Christ, and we need to reach out to anyone who is lonely. The church is Christ in person to a lonely world. And we have a lonely world out there where there's a lot of people who don't understand contact or relationships, and they need it. They need it bad. I'm going to talk more about it next week at that sermon, but let's be the church. Let's be Christ. Let's reach out to people who are lonely. Let's show them what the love of Christ is and what Christ's intimacy is about. Let's have nobody lonely in our church. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, it's amazing that you would come and be one of us and show up in person 
And Lord, it's, it's a wonderful thing that you would come and that you would even make the contact with a leper who's never even had contact before. So Lord, please make each one of us like that. People who are sacrificing and serving. People who are reaching out to lonely people who are unhappy in a lonely world. Please make us your people, your church, your body. In Jesus' name, amen.